So one of the most important things in our body to help with chemical reactions are enzymes. Enzymes are very, very, very important. Uh, and we talk, the reason that they're important is because they help with our metabolism. Our metabolism is not just how well we use energy in our body, but it's every single chemical reaction in our body. Every single one. Doesn't matter if it was just thinking and hearing, hearing the word hearing that resonated and had about a million different chemical reactions just from your eardrum to your brain. So that's all part of your metabolism. Um, those chemical reactions can be forming bonds, bringing things together, making things. Uh, another synthesis is another word for that. Synthesis just simply means to make. Okay? That is a very, very, very important key thing that we need to know and we need to have in our notes. Synthesis means to make. We, those are called anabolic reactions. Anabolic is building things or making things. But our metabolism and those chemical reactions can also break bonds between molecules or break things down. Uh, that's digestion and catabolic reactions. Uh, here we got a picture of Barry Bonds from his rookie year, and here is from one of his later years with the San Francisco Giants. The reason that they're called anabolic steroids is because anabolic is building things. So obviously here, Barry Bonds decided that he needed to build some of his muscles by taking anabolic steroids, allegedly. Enzymes do lots of things. They do like we said, they either synthesize or make things, they build things anabolically, or they can go through hydrolysis, which is digestion or catabolic or breaking things down. So here we have uh, one sugar, two sugars that are going to combine into a different sugar with the help of an enzyme. Here we have one big large sugar molecule called sucrose, sucrose that we're going to carotidize, break, or digest into two separate ones with the help of an enzyme. Energy is incredibly important for life. Without energy, we can't not live. But where does that energy come from? Well, that energy comes from a series of catabolic and anabolic reactions. So here we're going to take a group of uh, things called uh, a catabolic process. Here, this could be glucose, and we're going to break that glucose down. That's going to release energy when this bond is broken into two different molecules here. That energy gets used into the anabolic process where we're going to make something else that our body needs. Reactions are tough, though. They don't magically happen. Reactions need activation energy. Activation energy is the amount of energy that's required to start a chemical reaction. So here we have the reactants or what starts of a chemical reaction, and down here we have the product or what's finished. We got to keep putting energy in, put energy in, put energy in, put energy in, put energy in until it's finally ready to actually have the chemical reaction start. Okay, so it's kind of like going on a roller coaster. When you first get on the roller coaster, okay, you get the, you you have to go up the hill and 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 up the hill, up the hill until you come to the top of the hill and are ready for gravity to take over so you can make your product. It doesn't matter if it goes below the amount of energy or above the amount of energy, so you're overall losing energy or you're overall gaining energy, it doesn't matter. We still have that activation energy on both sides. So where does the activation energy come from? Okay. Well, here we have a whole bunch of cellulose, and we can put energy in the form of fire and make up a whole bunch of heat, which is energy, fire. If you didn't know, <laughs> that is really, really hot. If we added heat for the activation energy in our body, our proteins would lose their shape and no longer work, they become denatured. That's not a good thing because then no nothing else in our body can work. 
So what else can be done to fix the problem? We can't heat up everything to overcome the activation energy, so we need something else. That's where we use a catalyst. Okay, A catalyst reduces the amount of energy, the activation energy, to start a reaction. So before, we needed to go up the roller coaster high, high, so much energy, so much energy, so much energy to come back down and start going downhill. Here, with a catalyst, we only need to go here. So a little bit up, a little bit up, and then we can go down. So you can see we went from here, we lowered the activation energy. We took out that much energy so we could have this chemical reaction take place a lot easier. And a catalyst is what did that. Enzymes, oops, So again, here's with the uncatalyzed reaction, here's with the catalyzed reaction. Enzymes are biological catalysts, meaning they're organic. They're in our bodies. They have carbon and hydrogen in them. Enzymes are made of proteins. They facilitate chemical reactions. Remember, facilitate just means help. They reduce the activation energy. They increase the rate of the reaction without being consumed. That's huge. That means that they go into a reaction and come out of the reaction completely unchanged. They can go on forever and keep being reused and reused and reused. Okay? They're required for most of our biological reactions that we have in our body. They're highly specific. Okay? They have a specific shape to do a specific job. Period. If you're going to have something that's going to break glucose down, that's the only thing it can do. It can't break. It can't break sucrose down. It can't break fructose down. The only thing it can do is break glucose down. If you have an enzyme to build sucrose, the sugar that we eat, that's the only thing that it can do is build sucrose. It can't break sucrose. It can't build fructose or maltose or anything else. Highly specific. You have one shape for one job. And there's thousands of different enzymes in our cells. So just quickly in terms of some vocab, okay, we have a substrate, which is the reactant that binds to the enzyme. And what goes into the reaction? So here, that would be this molecule right here. Okay. Then we have our product. That's what comes out of the reaction. So here's a product and here's a product. And then we have the active site. Okay, The active site is the spot in the enzyme. So right here would be the active site. Okay, That's the spot in the enzyme where the substrate is going to fit into, kind of like a key fits into a lock. So it's a spot where the reaction happens. So here, this purple part, there's the enzyme. There's the substrate, and here's the products and the active site. Okay, so the properties of our enzymes. They're reaction specific, as we mentioned before. There's one enzyme for one job or one chemical reaction. It's a lock and key between the active site and the substrate. Again, structure and function. Does the shape fits the job? You have a shape to do a job. Kind of like a hammer has a specific shape to do a specific job of nailing nails into a piece of wood. You wouldn't want something in the shape of a soccer ball f to be used to hammer nails. It wouldn't work. It's not consumed in the reaction. They're unaffected. It comes in and same way as it goes out. Oops. Okay, and it lowers the activation energy. Three huge, huge things of what enzymes do. They're reaction specific because one shape for one job, structure and function. They're not consumed, which means they're reusable. They go in the same way as they come out. And they lower the activation energy of a chemical reaction. Huge. So here's what we mean by lock and key. Here we have the enzyme. Here we have our substrates. Here we have two of them. 
as you can see, this shape will fit in nicely for this active site and this shape will fit in nicely for this active site. They come in and together here we have an anabolic reaction because we're building things and here's our final product. So enzymes are made out of proteins. Proteins are folded in a particular way to give a specific shape to do a specific job. Certain conditions will make the proteins that make up an enzyme unfold. Boo, that's bad. If an enzyme or protein unfolds, it loses its shape. Again, if it loses its shape, it can't do its job. When an enzyme or protein unfolds, the enzyme or protein has become denatured. Notice we didn't say killed, okay? It, an enzyme or protein cannot die because it was never alive. We say it became denatured. It does no longer work. There's three things that can denature an enzyme. Numeral uno, a change in temperature. Number two, a change in pH. That's acid and base stuff, okay? And then last but not least, a change in ionic conditions. Think salt, okay? Other ionic condition type things uh, would be like when uh, sodium has a charge to it or when potassium has a charge or when chlorine has a charge to it, either a positive or a negative charge. Those are ions. So... Enzymes have an optimal temperature. What we mean by an optimum temperature is means that it has a nice range. Human enzymes have a range of 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. Okay, um, Our body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius. So if our proteins fall below that or above that, our proteins become denatured. Uh, specifically in heat, increase uh, beyond our optimum temperature range, okay, the increased heat disrupts the bonds of the enzyme, causing the enzyme to unfold, become denatured. It won't work. It loses its shape. Uh, cold basically means that the molecules move slower, meaning less reactions will take place. So enzymes and their temperature, here's a graph, I know we all love it. So here's 37 degrees, and we're going to say that this is our human enzyme, right? We'll work in this temperature somewhere around here. Here's our optimal temperature, here's our optimal temperature range for our human enzymes, okay? But not every single enzyme is going to work in or have the same optimum temperature range. For example, some bacteria that hang out in these really, really hot geysers, their optimal temperature range is out here at 70 degrees, okay? 70 degrees for a hot spring bacteria enzyme. So again, if this bacteria enzyme was down here, it wouldn't work. Yet, this enzyme needs to be here at 70 degrees to work. Won't work here, will work here. If you take our enzymes, which are supposed to work at around 37 degrees, and 70 degrees, they would denature bad. Okay. So not every enzyme has the exact same optimum temperature range. Different enzymes will have different optimum ranges. Nevertheless, whatever the optimum temperature range is, if you go outside of that optimum temperature range, the enzyme will become denatured. pH. pH or how acidic, how acidic a solution is. Okay. So this again, when we think pH, think acids and bases, okay? Uh, so again, we have an optimum range. If we go outside of that range, it disrupts the bonds and changes the shape. That's bad. That denatures the protein or the enzyme. Most of our human enzymes work at a pH or have a pH range of six to eight. By the way, water is 7.0. The most acidic you can get is 1.0. The most basic you can get is 14.0. Okay, but most human enzymes work between six and eight, have that optimum range. However, pepsin, which is an enzyme found in our stomach, has a pH range of two to three. So if you put pepsin into that pH range, pepsin would denature. Or if you put pancreatic amylase, that's in the small intestine, that has a pH of seven, into the stomach, what would happen? It'd lose its shape and become denatured. So again, all of them, all enzymes have their optimal 
pH range. It's not the same range, but each has their own optimal pH range. Whatever that range is, if you fall outside of the optimal pH range, pH range, the enzyme will become denatured. Last but not least are salt concentration, which is your ionic conditions. Ionic conditions, remember, is positive charges or negative charges. It changes the shapes. It affects the structure and the shape, and it denatures the protein. Enzymes are intolerant of extreme salinity or extreme ionic conditions. The Dead Sea has a huge amount of salt in it, which means lots and lots of ions. The Dead Sea is called dead for a reason. There's so much salt and ions there that none of the enzymes will actually work. They All the enzymes become denatured, which means we don't really have too much life in the Dead Sea. Three examples of enzymes. Okay, back up here. Uh, you need to be able to commit these to memory. First one is salivary amylase. Salivary saliva that happens in your mouth. Salivary amylase breaks down starch into sugar. By the way, it ends in ASE. Good chances. Most things, most enzymes, not all, but most enzyme ends in ASE. I'll do that in black for you here. Most enzymes end in A. S E. It's always a trigger. It's, if it ends in ASE, it's probably an enzyme. Next one. Okay, catalase. Catalase in your liver breaks down hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, into water, yay, and oxygen gas. Yay, both good things. And last but not least, what we mentioned before, pepsin, it's in your stomach. Remember, the stomach has a very, very low pH of about 2. Breaks down protein into amino acids. You will be responsible for all of those examples. A quick note about ATP. ATP stands for adenosine tri, tri meaning 3, Phosphate. So adenosine, A, tri, starts with a T, phosphate, ATP, that's where we get it. So if you notice, we have one, two, three phosphate groups, okay, and here's our adenosine molecule. So we have adenosine and one, two, three phosphates. So this is our ATP. ATP is energy. The way, and I know this sounds really crazy, um, and it doesn't sound like that big of a deal, but I promise it is. So here's how ATP gives energy. So here's our ATP. Okay, I'm going to erase all this stuff. Here's our ATP. When this phosphate gets broken off, ch -ch -ch, see you later. Okay, so now it looks like this. See, we had our ATP. Okay, we chopped off that last phosphate. So now we're left with are adenosine, A, and one, two phosphates, and two means di, so we have ADP. And we chopped off that phosphate, that releases all that energy. So when we have ATP and we chop off or break off one of the phosphates, that releases a ton of energy. That's releasing energy. And the leftovers is ADP, adenosine diphosphate, one, two phosphates, and an extra phosphate left over. Okay. If we wanted to make ATP, all that we would do is change this and go that way. Okay. So we would take ADP, one, two phosphates, plus an extra phosphate and combine those together to get adenosine 1,2,3-triphosphate. So really, we're making ATP if the arrow is pointing in the, to the left in the blue direction where we have ADP plus phosphate to make ATP. We're using energy if the arrow is going the green way, okay, where we have ATP 
gets broken off into ADP and inorganic phosphate. And that is all she wrote. It's like this and like that and like this, Anna. It's like that and like this and like that, Anna. It's like this. So just chill till the next episode.